Okay. So, good evening, everyone. Uh, I, my name is Vignesh Malia. Uh, I'm a part of the marketing team here with Noartis. And on behalf of Noartis, I'd like to welcome you all to today, this, this evening's session that we have on changing treatment landscape in HR positive HER2 negative ABC, uh, advanced breast cancer. So, our program director for this evening is Dr. Krupa Shankar, a, a well-known medical oncologist from Coimbatore, who will be introducing and getting uh, kickstarting this evening's program. So welcome, Dr. Krupa Shankar, for this uh, session, and I hand it over to you to take it forward. Welcome and thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you. So very good evening and a warm welcome to everyone who's logged in. And at the outset, before I Actually, begin. I'd like to take this opportunity to congratulate the organizers, Novartis, for taking this wonderful academic initiative, and also thank them for the opportunity. So, I think you know we're going to be touching base on the treat changing treatment landscape as far as hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer is concerned. And we've come a long way from the era of just hormonal therapy to the now of the new kids on the block, which are the CDK46 inhibitors. So, I'm sure we have an elite panel and we have an elite a list of oncologists together with us today who will join in for the discussion. And we're also led ably by our international experts, led by Dr. Joyce and Dr. Ellis. Welcome, both of you. We'll look forward to hearing from both of you again. And so with that, I think I'll set the ball rolling and hand it over back to the event management team to introduce our chairperson, Dr. Pavitran Sir. Yes, sir. So thank you for that. Uh, so maybe I can invite, it'll, it's of course my pleasure and honor to invite our chairperson for this evening, Dr. Pavitran, a key oncologist from Cochin. So welcome, Dr. Pavitran. Uh, for, and thank you for chairing this session. So I invite you to introduce the speakers and the sessions moving forward. So welcome once again. Yeah, good evening to you all. As uh, Dr. Krupashan already mentioned, the management of uh, Hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative, metastatic breast cancer have seen a sea change of changes during the last one decade. Especially with the introduction of uh, CDK inhibitors and PA3 inhibitors, this made a paradigm shift in the management of this type of cancers. So, the first talk is on the overview of uh, hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative breast cancer by Dr. Smitha. She's a medical associate professor of medical oncology at Kidwai Memorial Institute of Oncology, Bangalore. Over to Dr. Smitha, please. Thank you, sir. And thank you, Novartis, for this wonderful opportunity. So I'll share my screen. So I'll be talking in brief the overview of hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative metastatic breast cancer. So as we all know, so breast cancer is one of the most leading and frequently diagnosed cancer across the females in the world. So roughly if you take almost one fourth of the cases, almost 25% of the total cancer cases are because of breast cancer. And if you look the mortality, it roughly the breast cancer is uh, leads to almost 14 to 15 percent of the cancer mortality. Now, if you look at the Western data in the Western developed countries, almost one in eight women will develop uh, breast cancer anytime in their lifetime. A similar picture is seen in the Indian women. Almost we say one in four to five women will develop breast cancer in the as the age advances in the uh, developing nations and approximately in the breast cancer almost around 5% of the breast cancer when it is diagnosed it will be a metastatic disease. Now why are we talking about this metastatic disease so much is the survival rates, the overall survival drastically falls when the disease is diagnosed in the metastatic setting. If the disease is diagnosed in the localized or the early breast cancer, the overall survival is close to around 98 to 85%. Whereas a five-year overall survival for a metastatic breast cancer is roughly only around 23.3%. And the most important risk factors, we, as we all know, is the advanced age and the female gender itself. Now, for a newly diagnosed breast cancer, when it is, if it is seen in the advanced age, if it's a grade 3 disease, if the person is of elderly age, if it's a hormone receptor negative disease, 
and a HER2 positive disease. Usually, we say these are poor prognostic factors. Now, what is the stage of diagnosis? How does it matter? If you see over here in this table, the disease distribution in the US or the Western data, almost majority, almost 90% of the cases are in the early stage, either stage 0, stage 1 or stage 2. Whereas if you look at the Indian data, almost 75% of them are in the stage 3 or stage 4 disease, which says the still the awareness of the disease or the patients coming to the with the cancer detection is very at an advanced stage in the USA it's much earlier now if you look at the drugs approved for the advanced breast cancer in the initial bit before 1970 it was only chemotherapy for all patients of advanced metastatic breast cancer we used to only give any form of chemotherapy then came in 1977 the role of the first hormonal therapy, the tamoxifen. Then after almost 20 years, you had the anestrozole, the aromatase inhibitor, which first came in. And then the next five years saw the new, uh, newer molecules like the letrozole, eximestin and fulvestrant. But of late in the last 10 to 15 years, we have seen a wide variety of newer drugs with better response rates and uh, deeper responses. So you have the palbocyclib, the abimacyclib, the ribocyclib and the PI3K inhibitor, the alpilisib. So earlier when it was, it was only one drug, but now you have a variety of drugs for the hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative, advanced breast cancer. And you're seeing good responses with uh, better quality of life. So if you look at the endocrine cascade, roughly you have all this, uh, this cartoon depicts all the endocrine therapies which is available for our hormone receptor positive patients. So you have the initially the aromatase inhibitor, the, in them you have the non-steroidal aromatase inhibitors, the anestrozole and letrozole. If this, the patient fails on this, then you have the steroidal aromatase inhibitor, the eximestin. You have the estrogen receptor down regulator, the fulvestrant. The selective estrogen receptor modulators, the tamoxifen and the tormifen. Most of us use the tamoxifen. Then you have the CDK4-6 inhibitors, the palbocyclib, abimacyclib and the ribocyclib, which acts on the cell cycle. The HDAC inhibitor, Entinostat, though it's not available in India as of now. And the mTOR inhibitors, the Everlimus, which we also use in our patients with eximestin. But we have found that the toxicity is not well tolerated in our patients. Now coming to the, uh, the endocrine therapies like tamoxifen, which is a selective estrogen receptor modulator. It is usually used in our premenopausal women also in postmenopausal, but most of the time we give it for the premenopausal in the adjuvant therapy. And if the person has already progressed on your aromatase inhibitor and the patient has received in the adjuvant, then probably we use tamoxifen. Then you have these non-steroidal aromatase inhibitors, electrozole, anestrozole. You have the eximestin, which is a type 1 steroidal aromatase inhibitor, also approved for the uh, adjuvant therapy and also for metastatic breast cancer in combination with everlimus. And you have the fulvestrant, which is usually uh, the uh, choice of our hormonal therapy backbone along with your CDK4-6 inhibitor in the advanced breast cancer. Now, when, when do we select hormonal therapy and when do we go for chemotherapy? Now, most of the time when the patient comes to you with a metastatic breast cancer, uh, if it's a harm, we are always dependent on the first the IHC4 report that is the ER, PR, HER2 status and the KS7. This is a basic uh, uh, criteria to de define what kind of therapy the patient should re receive. The next important factor as per the ESMO and the ABC guidelines are if the person is in visceral crisis, then definitely the patient should receive chemotherapy. If not, if the patient is hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative, preferably go for hormonal therapy. So when do you say it's visceral crisis? When any of the organs are on the cusp of compromise. So they may be having lymphangitic lung metastasis or maybe extensive bone marrow replacement with the disease, a carcinomatous meningitis or a significant liver metastasis causing a significant liver compromise. That is, they should be having a liver involvement with increased bilirubin levels. Or if the patient is very symptomatic, that is a patient with lung mets having grade 3 of breathlessness or a person with the liver failure. Also upfront some of the persons may present to you with endocrine resistance 
or patients who have already been receiving adjuvant endocrine therapy, they will have the acquired resistance, secondary resistance. And in such patients, when you think endocrine therapy may not work, you'll always go ahead with the chemotherapy. Hormone therapy usually in patients who are not in visceral crisis, that, that is, the person may have multiple lung nodules or multiple uh, liver uh, mets, but they are not having significant uh, uh, liver damage, liver failure or lung involved uh, failure or they are minimally symptomatic or only bone metastasis, then in such cases, we'll usually prefer to go with hormonal therapy. Now, why this difference? Because hormonal therapy, we know it takes a longer time for the uh, response to set in and uh, the uh, progression of the disease should be slow. Now, if you looked at the real world data, so they looked at uh, data from around five European countries, roughly around 355 patients. And if you look over here in these three cohorts, almost 69 to 70% of the patients, the physicians preferred in the ER, uh, uh, hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative patients, the first line therapy was always endocrine therapy. Only around 31% of the patients, they prefer to go with a chemotherapy. So the real world data also refl uh, reflects our opinion that endocrine therapy is always preferred by the physicians. Now, why the physicians uh, choose endocrine therapy is either absence of life-threatening metastasis or the slow progression of the disease. And these are the major drivers for the choice of first-line endocrine therapy. So usually if you see majority of them, when there is absence of life-threatening metastasis or a slow speed of the disease progression, then they're comfortable in using endocrine therapy. If you think the grade of the tumor is very high, if the progression is uh, very fast, the disease biology is not good, then usually we will go ahead for uh, chemotherapy. So now coming to the CDK46 inhibitors, in this you have the palbociclib, abimacyclib and ribociclib. They all three are potent inhibitors of the CDK46 and it blocks the cell cycle progression from G1 to S phase, therefore suppresses the tumor growth. So they both are indicated, all the three drugs are indicated in the treatment of hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative advanced breast cancer in combination with aromatase inhibitor or fulvestrant. And the data comes from the Peloma 1 and Peloma 3 for the abimacyclic from the Monarch 1 and Monarch 2, Monarch 3, where they used in the locally advanced or the metastatic breast cancer. And it has shown that the addition of a CDK4-6 inhibitor improved the PFS with a significant safety profile. So the CDK4-6 inhibitors, we have three groups, the abimacyclib, the ribocyclib, and the palbocyclib. So in the hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative advanced breast cancer, in the front line, in the combination with the aromatase inhibitor in all postmenopausal women, all the three are approved. Front line in combination with the aromatase inhibitor in the pre or perimenopausal women, as per guidelines, ribocyclib is approved. In combination with fulvestrant, for uh, disease progression after endocrine therapy, again, abimacyclib, ribocyclib, and palbocyclib is approved. And as a monotherapy after disease progression with any endocrine therapy, abimacyclib is uh, usually approved. And as we all know, the usual toxicities of CDK4-6 inhibitors, the most important are the, one is the neutropenia. Uh, with abimacyclib, you see diarrhea and nausea to some extent. And the QTC interval prolongation with ribocyclib. The less common, very rarely we see sometimes interstitial lung disease or pneumonitis and also deep vein thrombosis. Uh, thrombosis. Now, next question comes, this drugs have done so much good in your advanced breast cancer, can it be used in your early breast cancer? Yes, the CDK4-6 inhibitors can also be, uh, there is uh, trials going on, phase two trials to look at the uh, use of CDK4-6 inhibitors in the early breast cancer in the adjuvant setting. So, you have the Monarch E and the Palace trial, which is already the recruitment is closed, and the Natalie trial with ribocyclic, which is still recruiting. So we are waiting for this data. Now the next drug which is used in this uh, hormone receptor HER2 negative breast cancers when you, they are failed on multiple lines of this uh, endocrine therapy is the mTOR inhibitors along with exemestin. So in mTOR inhibitors, the drug is usually everlimus because these M, uh, mTOR is a one of the downstream pathways and it blocks the downstream pathway and therefore prevents the uh, breast cancer uh, growth of the tumor. But usually what we have seen is 
the our patients do not tolerate the combination of everlumis and eczemistin in combination most of them come back with very a uh, lot of uh, side effects and they're not able to continue the drug so i think most of us in the clinical practice with the newer generation drugs we have almost stopped using everlumis now if you look at the mechanism of resistance in the hormone receptor positive uh, her to negative her to, uh, breast cancer these are the various uh, pathways so it may be at the estrogen receptor they may develop resistance or the pi3k akt mtor pathway the downstream pathways then you have the cdk46 uh, activation leading on to the endocrine resistance then the ras raf mec pathway the wegf and the fgf pathway so either of this any of this pathways can be uh, involved in the uh, resistance but the most important are the at the estrogen receptor level and at the pi3k akt mtor downstream pathways now this showed the importance of the pi3k pathway in the hormone receptor positive breast cancer so it was and almost 40% of the patients with hormone receptor breast cancer have a pi3k activating mutation and this if you inhibit this pi3k with inhibitors probably the the growth of the tumor is also arrested so the pi3k pathway was targeted with the pi3k inhibitor this is the alpalisib and it is a oral drug a potent inhibitor of the alpha isoform of the pi3k it also inhibits the other three isoforms the beta gamma and the delta isoform it's a selective inhibitor uh, with limited toxicity and it was showing in uh, initially showed benefit in the xenograft models and then it showed benefit in the uh, met advanced metastatic breast cancer patients so if you look at the nccn guidelines also it mentions the first line therapies as aromatase inhibitor with your cdk46 inhibitor that is either abemaciclib palbociclib or ribociclib as category 1 and then you have your selective er down regulator fulvestrent with any of the non steroidal aromatase inhibitor or fulvestrent with any of the cdk46 inhibitors as all these are category 1 and if a person progresses as already on the hormonal therapy A recurrent disease then you have to look at these biomarkers so here you have your braca mutations the pi3k ca activating mutation the other uh, pdl1 the ntrk so pi3k also it recommends you can either get it done to the blood or the tissue and the free appropriate agents are alpalisib with fulvestrent so the nccn now recommends ribociclib with endocrine therapy as a category 1 preferred treatment option for patients with hormone receptor positive her2 negative metastatic breast cancer and they can be given irrespective of the menopausal status and with any of the endocrine therapy partners either the aromatase inhibitor or the fulvestrant with this i end my talk and uh, thank you for the opportunity thank you dr smita for the very interesting presentation now we will go for the next talk that is picking the right strategy that is selection of uh, pathrig inhibitors by dr dhatraya is a medical thank you so much I kripa thank you so much kripa uh, uh, a very nice evening to everyone and to our forum faculty as well i am here to talk about picking the right strategy for patients who are hhr positive her to negative and pic 3 ca mutated with a special focus on alpalisib can Sir, request to share slides. Yeah, yeah, ma'am. I did inform uh, your team that if you could share the slides. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. If if you try to find out what's the most commonly mutated gene in HR positive HER2 negative advanced breast cancer, then the answer is the PIK three C A gene. In fact, forty percent of patients who are at next slide. and then some disclaimers there the next slide please so 40% of patients with hr positive or to negative advanced breast cancer have the pik3ca or the pik3ca mutation pik3ca mutated advanced breast cancer patients face a worse prognosis but more than that next slide it's important to know why pik3ca mutant advanced breast cancer patients need a different approach 
Of course, as I told you, next slide, it indicates poor prognosis. There was this study from Sobhani et al. looking at close to 650 MBC patients and then one more meta-analysis of close to 1,930 patients of breast cancer. And if you look at both these data, presence of the PIK3C mutation is a negative prognostic factor, has a poor response to a treatment which is not targeting the PIK3C mutation and overall a worse prognosis. But we now know that the PIK3C mutation can be a biomarker of response to treatment. So therefore, this is a predictive biomarker. It's also a poor, poor, poor prognostic biomarker in patients of HR positive, HER2 negative, advanced breast cancer. Essentially, four things happen when the PIK3CA gets mutated, and that's why it might help us in planning the treatment strategies of patients who have the PIK3CA mutation. Next slide. It correlates with more aggressive tumorigenesis, more cell proliferation, poor prognosis, and also endocrine therapy resistance. So probably it makes sense to know our patient's pig 3 ca mutation status. Next slide, alpelisip is a drug which specifically addresses the pig 3 ca mutation and that was very clearly demonstrated by the previous uh, faculty member. pig 3 ca mutations means hyperactivation of the PI3K alpha and that's a key component of the PI3K pathway. Now you have uh, something like four different PI3K forms, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. The alpha isoform specifically is the isoforms. With pelvis strand works synergistically to inhibit both the ER pathway and the PI3K pathway. So targeting the ER pathway and the PI3K pathway is therefore able to give a clear picture about targeting two different pathways by using two different drugs. Folvestrin to target the ER pathway and alpelisip to target the PI3K pathway and that results in synergism and therefore we're able to overcome resistance to endocrine basic therapy. So how do we test for the PI3, uh, for, the, for the PIK3 mutation? Next slide. So when to test? Which, which, which reason, which area to test the tissue biopsy, the liquid biopsy, which way to test RT-PCR, NGS, and what about the concordance of tissue based and plasma based PIK3CA mutations? Next slide. The reason why you need to test has been told it's a poor prognostic biomarker, but more than that, it's a predictive biomarker with a response to alpha based treatment. When to test? The day, the day you see a patient that are positive and advanced and HER2 negative advanced breast cancer, you should get these patients for the pig 3 ca tested. pig 3 ca mutations are stable, which means they do not tend to change over time. So testing it today or after, say, um, 10 months or 24 months when progression happens, either way is fine. pig 3 ca mutations commonly happen can happen in multiple coding regions, but 80% of them are confined to exon 9 and exon 20 of the pig 3 ca gene. How do you test for it? Either next generation sequencing, but fortunately we do have assistance with the FDA approved Thera, Thera screen RGQ kit readily available in India. So both are fine, either next generation sequencing or go for the pig 3 ca Thera screen test. Which sample? Now here it's important to know that you could test the tissue or the liquid. Next slide. So when you test, uh, it helps us uh, in, in identifying how the treatment plan can be laid down for that particular patient. Next slide. So fulvestrin and alpelisib is a category one preferred option in the NCCN clinical guidelines uh, for treatment of advanced breast cancer. If it's a tumor tissue biopsy, and if that's tested positive, then alpelisib and fulvestrin. If negative, then do not give alpelisib fulvestrin. The liquid biopsy, which means looking at the CTD in a peripheral blood, if it tests positive, the patient is a suitable candidate for alpelisib fulvestrin. If it tests negative, you somehow should try to get a tissue, a tumor tissue, and then check for the PIK3CA mutation on that tissue as well. 
So a tissue biopsy positive is positive, a liquid biopsy negative does not mean negative. You should always try to get tumor tissue and then check that for pig 3 ca mutation before you label the patient as pig 3 ca mutation not present. Because you would then lead, you would then probably miss out a significant portion of patients who might benefit from the combination of alpha-lysif fulvestrate. Now, with that background, let me go on to the SOLAR1 phase 3 trial, which was the first phase 3 trial, next slide, which led to approval specifically for advanced breast cancer patients who are pig 3 ca mutated. You had 562 patients in this trial. This was randomized, double blind placebo controlled, multi center phase 3 trial. 60% of them had the pig 3 ca mutation. And the primary endpoint was to look at the PFS in patients who have the pig 3 ca mutation and investigation as investigator assessment of the PFS. So the, these patients were randomized. One is to one to fulvestrant alpelisib 300 mg daily orally or fulvestrant plus placebo. These were patients who are postmenopausal, HR positive, HER2 negative, advanced breast cancer. During or after uh, arrows, uh, after AI therapy, there was progression of breast cancer. ECOG PS0 or 1 and the pig 3 ca mutation was identified. The primary endpoint was investigator assessed progression to survival. And let's look at what happened to the PFS when you add alpelisib to fulvestrant. Next slide. The PFS almost doubles. Fulvestrant single agent, the median PFS is less than six months, 5.7 months, and it's 11 months by adding alpha to fulvestrant. What's important to note is that the curves separate very rapidly. In the first two months, you find that is the, the, the separation of the curves is pretty much evident. With a hazard ratio of 0.65, it, it, it translates to a 35% reduction in risk of progression and with a highly significant p value. Next slide. Now, these results are consistent across various subgroups. Visceral metastasis, yes or no. Bone only disease, yes or no. Prior, uh, around 20% of 20 patients in this trial did receive a CDK46 inhibitor. 11 patients in the fulvestrant harm and 9 patients in the fulvestrant alpelisib arm. But whether the patient has received a prior CDK46 or not, the, the results, uh, the, it, it, the patients stand to benefit by adding alpelisib or fulvestrant. Prior chemotherapy, whatever adjuvant, new adjuvant, uh, the line of advanced cancer treatment, endocrine status, primary or secondary resistance, essentially. Actually, all subgroups stand to benefit by adding alpha lysip to fulvestrate. So the primary endpoint was met. It more than doubled the PFS from 5.7 months to 11 months. What about the response rate? Next slide. Even the response rates also were more than doubled. Patients who had measurable disease. Next slide. Versus look at all the patients. The response rates from 13 to 16 percent are 27 to 36%. So better responses more than two times in, in patients with uh, measurable disease. Now, we know that when we talk about response rates, we talk about um, complete responses and partial responses, which means that more than 30% tumor shrinkage should happen. But then there are a good number of patients where the disease does not progress. In fact, the tumor does shrink, though it doesn't meet the category of a partial response, the definition of a partial response. Next slide. So tumor shrinkage in reality happens in 76% of patients who had measurable as a baseline. And then you found that in our three out of four patients, the tumor does shrink in a, in, in a very significant proportion of them. The responses are deep. The responses are deep. The responses are durable, and 76% of patients actually have tumor shrinkage. Now, this drug is available as a 150 mg tablet and a 50 mg tablet. Next slide. So, when you look at the dosing of alpelisib, the standard dose is 300 mg once a day, which means the patient takes two tablets of 150 mg each. You take it once daily with food. And uh, when you need to reduce the dose for an adverse event, you go in decrements of 50 milligram. So the, the dose level minus one 
A is 250 mg, the dose level minus 2 is 200 mg. Fulbistrant, as we know, is standard. Uh, once into uh, day 1, 15, 29 in the first cycle and afterwards monthly thereafter. There are, so we've understood that this drug is efficacious and it doubles, more than doubles the overall response rate. Uh, three out of four patients, 76% of the tumor shrinkage, it also almost doubles the PFS. But then we have to balance safety with efficacy. Next slide. And that's why we need to have some ideal considerations before putting our patient on ampelicid because we need to know what side effects to expect, expect and how can we uh, tackle these uh, side effects either proactively or when required. Next slide. So looking at the grade three, four adverse events, the GI symptoms like diarrhea, nausea, Stomatitis, vomiting are grade 3, 4 in less than 10% of patients. Grade 3 fatigue in 5% of patients. Less than 4% of patients have a grade 3, 4 weight loss. 37% of patients have grade 3 or 4 hyperglycemia. And close to 20% of patients have a grade 3 or more skin rash. So what stands out clearly is when you add alpha's bulbous strand, you end up having 37% of patients having a grade 3, 4 hyperglycemia and 20% of patients having a grade 3, 4 or 4 skin rash. And so let's look at these two side effects for a few minutes. Next slide. So insulin signaling happens through PI3 kinase and that drives glucose uptake into the cell, keeping the blood glucose levels in check because the glucose transporters are moving to the cell surface. But when you use ampelicib, then the PI3K inhibition blocks the glucose uptake. And so the GLUT stays inside the cell and that leads to more circulating glucose. And accordingly, we have dose modifications to manage hypoglycemia. Next slide. As long as the fasting glucose is less than 160, you don't require dose adjustment. Between 160 and 250 is a grade 2 hyperglycemia. Again, alpha need not be adjusted, but you start oral anti-diabetic. Once it's more than 250, then you rec preferably require an endocrine specialist consultation and you need to stop alpha -lysip. So therefore, closely look at the glucose levels and also involve endocrine specialist from day zero itself. In fact, the only lab testing you need to do for patients on alpelicid is, next slide, fasting plasma glucose and HPA1C. Make sure the solar one trial, all patients had fasting plasma glucose less than a one equal to 140 and HPA1C of less than equal to 6.4%. Both these criteria had to be met even if you had a patient who had a controlled type 2 diabetes. And uh, depending on that, in, depending on that, you do the assessment of these two parameters. Now, what about skin rash? Next slide. Prophylactic management of skin rash reduces the incidence and severity of lash. And that's clearly brought out in the SOLAR-1 trial. For instance, your patient receives prophylactic treatment with antihistamines along with the alpelisib. 73% of patients do not experience rash and hardly 12% of patients have a grade 3 rash. But when prophylactic antihistamine is not given, then this number reverses. 37% of patients only are uh, spared and don't have the rash. In fact, 23% of patients have a grade 3 rash and 41% of patients have grade 1 or grade 2 rash. Therefore, and prior to the onset of rash, using prophylactic antihistamines at the initiation of and during alpha treatment makes perfect sense. So with that now, and the adverse event profile having been discussed, let's look at how the quality of life is impacted by adding alpha to fulvestrin. Next slide. And so you had the EORTC scores and the brief pain inventory scores, which were looked at in this trial. Next, please. The EORTC looked at the past week data for assessment. The BPI looked at the past 24 hours. Next slide. To sum it up, the quality of life and functional status, next please, were maintained on alpha treatment. Next slide. 
it maintained the quality of life in patients over time. Over a period of 28 months or more than two years, there was no major difference seen between the two treatment arms. Next slide. In fact, if anything, the physical and functional and emotional functioning subscale actually favored the alpha arm. It also showed a positive impact, next slide, on symptom management. It improved pain scores, dyspnea, insomnia, and constipation when compared to the placebo arm. So if anything, your patient stands to benefit by adding alpha-lisip to fulvestrend, provided you are on the watch out for the adverse events, especially prophylactic antihistamines and a close watch on the glucose levels. And the last slide of my talk, next slide to summarize, 40% of HR positive, HER2 negative ABC patients have pic 3 cm mutations. They indicate a poor prognosis, but alpha um, tablets specifically also target the pic 3 cm mutation biomarker. It nearly the solar in patients have pic 3 cm mutation. The median PFS was 11 month, hazard ratio is 0.65. It more than doubled the response rate. And as I told you, tumor shrinkage happened in 76% of patients. The adverse events are manageable. They are reversible. There is no statistical difference in the deterioration of the global health status and quality of life between the arms. The physical, emotional, cognitive, dual functioning were similar or slightly better in the alpha So, clinical decisions must consider efficacy and tolerability. Taking clinical efficacy, these results support the benefit risk profile along with the statistically significant and clinically meaningful PFS seen by adding by adding alpha-lisip to fulvestrin in patients who are HR positive. HER2 negative and pic 3 cm mutant advanced breast cancer. Thank you so much, Krupa Shankar, for making me a part of this fantastic CME. Thank you, Dr. Dattatraya, for the very lucid talk on the alpha-lisip. Now, the next is the much awaited guest lecture by Joyce Shaughnessy. She is chair of breast cancer research and the celebrating woman chair in breast cancer at Baylor Summons Cancer Center, Texas. She is chair of US Somebody Network and she helped to bring molecules like capsidabin and gemcitabin to the market. And she's a member of many organizations like AACR and ASCO and a recipient of many international awards. And she has ordered more than 250 publications. Over to Dr. Shansi, please. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. Thanks so much for joining in this evening to talk about hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer and the evolving data, certainly a very active area because we can't cure people yet, our women yet, but we can give them prolonged quality of life, prolonged control of disease. And now we can substantially improve the duration of their life, which of course is critically important. And we want to all know the, uh, the latest data uh, in this regard. So I'm going to talk about a patient case. And um, we had some really great lectures just now, so we know a lot about the treatment goals, but I'll just touch on that and then CDK4 in inhibition and some of the guideline recommendations and then specifically focus on Mona Lisa 2 study outcomes, which has just been published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is great to see. And then a little bit of comparison of ribocyclob to other inhibitors and then summarize the, um, the case. So this patient is a 54 year old woman who presented to her healthcare professional with a mass in her breast it was four centimeters in the right breast with palpable axillary lymph nodes. Ultrasound and mammogram confirmed these physical findings and biopsy showed hormone receptor positive HER2 negative ductal breast cancer grade two with a key 67 of 20%. But at presentation, she was metastatic. CT scans and bone scans showed multiple small lung lesions and biopsy was positive for hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative breast cancer. So she had de novo metastatic uh, disease. And so unfortunately, we don't have cure as a treatment goal um, realistically yet for this patient, but we certainly want to improve her survival as much as possible. We want to decrease treatment-related toxicity. 
if she's got symptoms, we want to relieve symptoms and we want to maintain or improve her quality of life. Now, historically, the first line treatment has been endocrine therapy alone, mainly aromatase inhibitors. But of course, over the last um, five years or so, five or seven years, the CDK4-6 inhibitors have joined the aromatase inhibitors in the first line setting unless a patient's breast cancer is recurring on an adjuvant aromatase inhibitor, in which case she gets full vestrant and a CDK4-6 inhibitor first line. And then second line, if she were to be a, one of the very small percentage of patients who get single agent endocrine therapy first line, then she would get full vestrin CDK4-6 inhibitor second line. If she receives a CDK4-6 inhibitor plus an AI first line, she could get single agent full vestrin, um, perhaps coming up before long the, an oral surd. But most of us will continue doublet therapy either with alpelacid, as we've just heard with full vestrin, or with eximestane everolimus if the breast cancer is PIK3CA wild type, or chemotherapy if the disease has become um, very endocrine therapy resistant in its biology. And then if she starts with full vestrin CDK4-6 inhibitor first line because she was recurring on an adjuvant AI, then she usually would go on to inhibition of the PI3 kinase pathway second line. And then we try to continue um, endocrine therapy even beyond this third line as demonstrated here. I have found, for example, that patients who benefit from eximestane everolimus for six months or longer, a lot of times when their disease progresses, the breast cancer will respond to single agent endocrine therapy, such as tamoxifen, for example. So uh, I, as we all try to prolong the benefit from endocrine therapy as long as we possibly can um, in the metastatic setting. The international guideline committees, such as ESMO, ASCO, and NCCN, all endorse uh, endocrine therapy as the mainstay of treatment in HR-positive, HER2-negative metastatic breast cancer patients. And of course, the CDK4-6 inhibitors combined with an AI has become the guideline preferred first-line um, hormonal therapy because of response rates of 40%, clinical benefit rates of 80%, medium PFS in excess of two years. And now, as we'll hear with um, ribocyclib, a very big improvement in overall survival uh, as well. So we've heard a very nice lecture here from um, Dr. Saldana about the role of CDK4-6 inhibitors. They really are key in um, tumor genesis and proliferation in HR-positive breast cancer. The CDK6 also complexes with cyclin D1, but cyclin CDK4 is much more important. It's much more um, uh, highly expressed compared to CDK6. Um, so it is the key protein, the key kinase that complexes with CDK, I mean, with um, cyclin D1 is CDK4. And then that complex really, it phosphorylates RB and liberates the transcription factor E2F, which then drives the cell cycle. And inhibition of CDK4 really is very, very potent anti-proliferative strategy. And the um, available agents, of, they penetrate tumor cells, bind to and inhibit CDK4, of course, because we know that they're all very um, effective. So Dr. Saldana showed us that the CDK4-6 inhibitors inhibit the transition to from G1 to S phase. So they um, the cells pile up in G1. And what's very um, good about this target, CDK4 and 6 kinases, they're serine, serine threonine kinases, that these kinases are inhibited by these palbocyclib, ribocyclib, and abemocyclib, is that they are, um, they inhibit all the different ways that HR positive breast cancers drive proliferation. So because the estrogen receptor leads to the transcription of cyclin D1, um, which then complexes, of course, with CDK4 and 6, inhibiting CDK4 and 6 is a way to shut down ER, direct, uh, directly driven proliferation. But for example, IGF-1R insulin 
receptor, the whole HER family, FGFR1, all these other things that can drive the um, cell cycle in HR positive breast cancer, they all impinge upon the estrogen receptor and phosphorylate it and drive transcription. So when you inhibit CDK4 and 6, you're inhibiting all the different ways that the cell knows how to proliferate. So it's a, these are fabulous targets for HR positive um, proliferation in, in breast cancer. So we do have uh, several, three to choose from, of course. And these are the kinds of things we consider in terms of deciding between chemotherapy, potentially a very small proportion of patients with endocrine therapy alone, or choosing among the CDK4-6 inhibitors. So stage of the disease at presentation, is it de novo? Was it initially locally um, advanced with um, intervening therapy? The sites of disease, how many sites of metastatic disease, which sites, and obviously, importantly, the burden of disease, treatment history, if any cancer-related symptoms, disease-free interval, giving us a window into endocrine therapy sensitivity, pre- or post-menopausal, history of drug-induced side effects that we need to keep in, to keep in our mind, um, patient and treatment team preference is would daily be better for the patient or three weeks on, one week off, can the patients manage that schedule? And then health insurance, and in other words, availability of an agent for the patient. So in the first line setting, addition of the CDK4-6 inhibitors to endocrine therapy significantly improved PFS, all three of them, response rate and clinical benefit rate of endocrine therapy alone. And so heretofore, they've all had very similar um, results in terms of their the data of eff effectiveness in the first line setting with these three very important um, parameters. But now we have survival, as we'll look at here in a uh, moment. This is a summary of the clinical trials for the approved CDK4-6 inhibitors um, with not focusing here on survival. And you're very well familiar with these data. It's interesting to look at the hazard ratios here for PFS. They're really all around 0.5. And we see the PFS is up there in excess of um, three years, excuse me, in excess of two years. Uh, where I'm looking at the Mona Lisa 3 trial, which was first and second line with Fulvestra with a median PFS of 33 months, which is really very, um, very impressive. And then response rates are in the 40 to 50, 60% range. Clinical benefit rate, though, I would argue is um, equally important to response rates. And those are all around 80, 80% 80 in the first line setting. So certainly big advances over endocrine therapy uh, alone, really, really huge. But what about survival? Very, very important takes a while, of course, for the survival data to mature. And so in the box on the left, we see the three ribocyclib trials. So I'm only so two, of course, first line postmenopausal with an aromatase inhibitor, the Mona Lisa three first and second line with fulvestrant in postmenopausal patients, and then the Mona Lisa seven in premenopausal patients, first line um, approved with an aromatase um, inhibitor. And we see significant survival advantages in these trials, mostly first line, but as well, second line and Mona Lisa 3. The other place we've seen survival is in second line with a bemocyclib in the Mona Lisa 2 trial. Um, this was actually, there were some patients first line, they were, they were, it was with fulvestrin. They were patients whose disease was recurring on adjuvant AI or within a year of finishing their adjuvant AI. And so they, there was a survival advantage in Monarch 2. We're waiting for results of first line of emocyclib Monarch 3 with AI and first line postmenopausal Poloma 2 with AI. So we don't have the first line data with abemocyclib or palbocyclib at this time. Poloma 3, which was first and second line with fulvestrant, was not statistically significant for survival. You know, having said that, 20% of patients had had chemotherapy in this study. And so the patient population was a little bit different than all the other studies shown here, which um, did not allow prior metastatic 
chemotherapy for eligibility. So Paloma 3 was a little bit of a different trial, but did not make statistical significance for uh, overall survival. So it's certainly interesting to see that all three of the ribocyclob trials are associated with improvement in uh, survival. So let's have a look at the data for postmenopausal women that are the most relevant to our practice, the Mona Lisa 2 data. And this is, of course, a phase three trial specifically in postmenopausal women in the first line setting, uh, looking at uh, letrozole plus placebo versus letrozole plus ribocyclob. And we had previously seen a very um, uh, important improvement in progression free survival from 16 months to 25.3 months that was significant. And now we'll have a chance to look here at the final overall survival data. So this randomized phase three was placebo controlled double blind, 668 patients globally, and prior neoadjuvant or adjuvant endocrine therapy, including tamoxifen, was allowed, but no um, therapy whatsoever for metastatic disease. Homo receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancer locally assessed with the primary endpoint of locally assessed PFS and secondary endpoints of survival response rate, clinical benefit rate, safety, and quality of life. And the key secondary endpoint was overall survival, and it was a one-to-one -one randomization. And the ribocyclob is 600 milligrams daily, taken once per day uh, for 21 days, followed by seven days off with uh, letrozole. And so here are the final overall survival data. We see the median survival in the control arm with letrozole placebo of 51.4 months, and that increased to 63.9 months with the addition of ribocyclib. And so that was in excess of five years overall survival. So this is the longest survival um, result we've seen in any first line metastatic phase three trial. So a very impressive result. And in, in the um, arrow there on the right, you see that the improvement was an absolute improvement of 12.5 months um, improvements. So a really an impressive improvement in overall survival. And the hazard was 0.76, so a 24% reduction in the risk of death. And we see the p-value of 0.004. So very impressive. It looks like the curves are continuing to pull apart and continue to pull apart um, over time. In fact, the um, absolute improvement in overall survival did increase over time by six years, 72 months there, we see a 12.2% absolute improvement in the percentage of patients still alive at six years, 44% of patients still alive versus 32% at six months. So, you know, clearly a very nice impact on survival. And this is the forest plot. Basically, from a statistical standpoint, all of the subsets benefited um, with regard to survival, adding ribocyclob 2, letrozole, regardless in the top red box of number of sites of metastatic disease, so heavy tumor burden versus not, liver metastasis, lung metastasis, liver or lung involvement, bone only. De novo metastatic, it looks like there's a little bit of a skew there, but it's not statistically significantly different. But clearly the de novo metastatic patients whose breast cancer would be considered you know, the most endocrine therapy sensitive had this, you know, 0.5 improvement in overall uh, survival. But with the uh, non-de novo metastatic, statistically, there was not a difference between the two. So even though they, they um, the point estimate clearly was different, but statistically, there was no difference between uh, the two. Um, the ribocyclib uh, addition to letrozole delayed time where patients required their first chemotherapy by more than a year. Uh, by approximately, I beg your pardon, it's 11.7 months um, longer to have to initiate chemotherapy in patients who started off with ribocyclob compared to uh, letrozole placebo. And then, you know, one of the things I you know Dr. Saldana was saying is, you know, when do we have to use chemotherapy first line? And it's for patients who really are in their uh, vital, a vital organ is about to fail on them. So we, we clearly need rapid tumor reduction in a proportion of patients. And we can see that over on the left, for example, 
32% of patients had the uh, fastest and, and most dramatic decrease in the size of their a tumor. This is broken up into uh, quartiles here. And you can see the percentage of patients who had the most dramatic reductions in tumor size. And we can see um, for each of the quartiles in terms of uh, the reduction in tumor volume that the patients did better with ribocyclob compared to letrozole alone. And if you look at the actual size um, of the tumor and how quickly it reduces, within six weeks, and certainly within eight weeks when patients have had two full months of treatment, they've already had a substantial reduction in tumor size. And you know, it doesn't usually take that much reduction in tumor size for our patients to breathe better, for liver function tests to start to improve. So we can, we can usually very, very rapidly, I think just as rapidly with the CDK4-6 inhibitors, reduce tumor volume as we can with chemotherapy. I, I actually think they're the better choice than chemotherapy, even in visceral crisis. They just haven't been as they haven't been studied there. So we just don't have that data. But I, I think they're more likely to work. There's an 80% chance of patients benefiting for six months or longer. That's better than we get even with combination chemotherapy. So we we get very rapid tumor reduction and deep tumor reduction with CDK four six inhibitors, you know, as we as we do with chemotherapy, perhaps even even better. The um, most patients stayed on the ribocyclib and letrozole in Mona Lisa two. Um, if we look down at patients who stopped the ribocyclib because of an adverse event in Mona Lisa two, it was eleven percent of patients, and I think it's less in our daily practice. It's because, of course, the protocol has very strict criteria for dose reduction due to neutropenia, for example. And then if patients still stay for a prolonged period of time at grade three neutropenia, protocols generally will require stopping therapy. But in my own practice, I've come to tolerate grade three neutropenia. I'll do one dose reduction if it's prolonged and patients are not coming back up to grade one or two. I'll, if it's prolonged, I will do one dose reduction, but not two, because I find the patients just simply don't get into trouble. They don't get um, febrile neutropenia. They don't get infections. So I um, will tolerate it. But protocols require stopping for persistent grade three neutropenia in spite of dose reduction. And that's why I think we see 11% of patients stopping the uh, ribocyclob in Mona two, much less in my own practice. It's very, very rare to need to stop it. I would say. And what are the main toxicities? We're all very familiar with the uh, all grade neutropenia was a 77%. Uh, percent. And, um, and of course, with letters all alone, very rare. We do see some abnormal liver function tests all grade about 20% with ribocyclib. We see 34% vomiting compared to 17% with the Letrozole alone. We see some fatigue, but very, very modestly uh, different than letrozole alone. We do see some nausea, diarrhea, but this is very um, uncommon to be more than the occasional loose stool. Um, and then 34% of patients do have grade one alopecia compared to 16% with letrozole alone. So that's something I do mention to patients that there could be some hair thinning, but um, always at the grade one level, never more than that. So the main one, of course, is neutropenia. And grade four neutropenia was only 10% with the uh, ribocyclin. And grade three is 50% 50, uh, 50 grade three. The, um, uh, this shows preclinical data that's interesting, showing that the differential inhibition of CDK4 versus CDK6, looking at um, IC50s, is eightfold higher. Ribocyclob is eightfold, eightfold more potent against CDK4 than for CDK6. Abemocyclob is sixfold more potent, and palpocyclob is about equipotent on CDK4 and CDK6. What's interesting is in preclinical models, the free drug concentration of ribocyclob is very high. It's um, 520 nanomolars, much higher an order of magnitude higher than abemocyclib and palbocyclib. And this is in preclinical models, but it's got 
very good um, oral, oral bioavailability. Um, but these high peak concentrations can lead to a small percentage of patients having QT prolongation as well as liver function abnormalities. Both of those toxicities are peak dose effects. And so if your patient ends up being one of the uncommon patients that has grade three hepatic toxicity, a dose reduction will simply take care of it because it's a peak dose effect. The QT prolongation is indeed very rare, um, less than 1% and very, very, very uncommon to be clinically significant. Uh, but if you do encounter that, a dose reduction will take care of that because it's, it's a peak dose effect down to the 400 milligrams a daily. Um, of course, diarrhea is the big toxicity of abemocyclob. It tends to tachyphylax over time. And then neutropenia is the main toxicity of palbocyclob. So let's go um, back and look at this patient we were talking about who presents now with de novo metastatic disease found on staging evaluation to have pulmonary metastasis. So ribocyclob with endocrine therapy is the only first line treatment now with an overall survival benefit for this patient. So I think it is, can be considered the preferred treatment option for hormones that are positive HER2 negative postmenopausal patients. It has become my preferred option. I don't use it for every single patient in the first line setting, but it is my preferred option for patients um, in, the, in the first line setting when I'm going to be choosing a CDK4-6 inhibitor for that patient. And it's because of this consistent overall survival benefit, regardless of pre or postmenopausal, or in patients I need to use fulvestrant instead of an aromatase inhibitor. It has survival in all three of those major, uh, major settings. And so it's got the longest reported median overall survival in any of our endocrine therapy, HER2 positive or chemotherapy a phase three studies. And um, it's over five years of median survival. It does delay the time to chemotherapy by a year. As I mentioned, it does maintain quality of life in the first line um, patients across all three of the Mona Lisa studies. And it's got um, consistent and manageable safety uh, profile. So with that, I'll thank you for your attention and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you for the very extensive presentation. And uh, any questions uh, from the audience? There are no questions in the chat box. I think we can take it uh, during our panel uh, discussion. Okay. Okay, then we'll go for the next talk. That is by Dr. Eli B. Brigas from the Philippines. She's the section head medical oncology at Cebu Doctors University Hospital, Philippines, and past president of the Philippine Society of Medical Oncology. She'll be talking on landmark therapeutic milestones for premenopausal HR positive HER2 negative advanced breast cancer. Over to Dr. Villegas, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Pabithran. Can you see my slides now? Yes, yes, please go ahead. Yes, good evening everyone and Dr. Joyce O'Shaughnessy, good morning. I'm very honored to be sharing the virtual floor to, with all of you. So I will be sharing updated results of the Mona Lisa 7. And apart from that, I will also be sharing my personal patient's case, a premenopausal case. So let me start. This is a case of MCS, a 45-year-old female. She's married, Ravita 2, Para 2. She's premenopausal. She works as a clerk of court. Her hypertension is controlled with the combination of amlodipine and losartan. She's non-smoker, non-alcoholic drinker. She doesn't have any family history of cancer. And when she accidentally hit her right shoulder on the wall in May of last year, she then noted persistent pain on the right armpit. And then she noted also a breast mass. That is when she immediately sought consult with the surgeon. 
who did a mammogram and it confirmed a Byrod's 4B, 4 centimeter right breast mass with an axillary node. So she went on with a corneal biopsy of the right breast mass. And this was invasive lobular carcinoma grade one. And also uh, an aspirate of the right axillary node, and that was metastatic lobular carcinoma, ER positive, PR positive, HER2 negative, K67 of 20%, and she was then referred to medical oncology service with my service. And a physical exam, she was very well, she's overweight, with a BMI of 26, her vitals were normal, she's not in pain. I felt a 1.5 centimeter soft anterior neck mass, and also palpable right axillary node around 2 cm, right breast mass with overlying skin thickening. The breast mass was around five centimeters, clear lungs. I mentioned about the mammogram and saw the mammogram earlier, but that was about 5.4 centimeter right breast mass, which was solid with an axillary mass, and that was Byrad's 4B. We did an FNAB of an anterior neck mass, and this was suspicious for papillary thyroid cancer. Her 2D echo was unremarkable, as well as her ECG with a QTC interval of 406 milliseconds. And these were the baseline labs. CBC was normal, as well as the electrolytes, although a slightly high alkaline phosphatase and elevated CEA and CA15-3. We did a baseline CT scan of the chest and liver, and this revealed a right breast mass, so that was about 5 by 4.7 by 4.6 centimeter with cutaneous thickening and some subcutaneous nodules and fat stranding. There was also right axillary node, about 2 centimeters and some mediastinal nodes. And the biggest was in the prevascular area of about 2.2 centimeters. She also has bilateral pulmonary metastases. The biggest was 1 centimeter on both um, lobes, right and left. The thyroid lobe was non-specific 2.5 centimeters on the left side, and there was a solitary liver METS 2 by 2.5 by 2 centimeters. Her baseline bone scan is this one, foci of abnormal tracer accumulation denoting bone metastasis in multiple areas in the manubrium, in the ribs, in the mid-cervical area, and even in the thoracic lumbar, and also bilaterally in the hips. We confirmed this bone metastasis with an MRI of the spine, and she had hemangioma of the lumbar area. However, the right iliac bone and the right acetabulum had clear metastasis over here, and also abnormal marrow signals denoting bone metastasis of the cervical area of T11 and T12. Hence the impression of breast cancer stage four with lung, liver, lymph node, and bone metastasis, she's luminal B, she's premenopausal. So this is de novo metastatic disease and a consideration of papillary thyroid cancer. So I gave the option of first hormonal treatment with CDK4-6 inhibitor and option number two with chemotherapy, although she's not in visceral crisis. She opted for option number one. Hence, we started with LHRH agonists with goceroline Zolidex, 3.6 milligrams of cutaneously, and this was followed a week after with ribociclib. We call it Quixana in the Philippines. This was initiated at 600 milligrams once daily, three weeks on, one week off, in combination with letrozole femara of 2.5 milligrams, one tablet once a day, and she was given monthly infusions of zolidronic acid once a month, and she did require any radiation to the bone metastasis as she was asymptomatic for it. This is a tabulation of her laboratory. So you have to go from reading from right to left. This one here is, are the labs after cycle number one of ribociclib. So she has um, grade one to two neutropenia, no febrile neutropenia. And then after cycle two, she had grade three neutropenia with no febrile neutropenia. So we, so we increased the rest period to 10 days from seven days. On the 10th day, the CBC already returned to grade two. Hence, I resumed the ribociclip at 600 milligrams and did not reduce it to 400 milligrams. After cycle three, there was again reduction in the absolute neutrophil count to grade three, still no febrile neutropenia. We increased the rest period again to 10 days from seven days. And indeed that returned to grade two. And from there on, I already increased the rest period to 10 days instead of the usual seven days. There was already softening of the right breast mass. I mean the cutaneous thickening on the right breast and also reduction in the size of the right axillary and right breast mass. This is the repeat 
CT scan of the chest and liver, and this was after cycle six of the combination of ribociclib, letrozole, and gusarelin. There's reduction in the right breast mass from five cm. It's now 3.4 centimeters as well as the axillary nodes. That's, that's from 2.2, that it's become, I think, 1.8, and uh, the mediastinal nodes as well and also reduction in the size of the pulmonary metastasis. There are stabilization of the thyroid node lobule, uh, thyroid nodule on the left side and of the liver metastasis. So at present patient is very well. She's ECOG zero. She's not in pain. The palpable mass on the right breast is already less than three centimeters, still with orange peeling, but um, it's softer. So she's breast cancer stage four with lung, lymph node, liver, and bone metastasis, not in visceral crisis with a partial response after 10 cycles of the combination of ribociclib, letrozole, and gusarelin. We intend to continue this combination until disease progression, continue monthly IV zoledronic acid, and we tend to evaluate the bone status very soon and to continue evaluating imaging every four to six months. So what should be a treatment goal for patients like this, young age at diagnosis with breast cancer? And we know that with young age, that it's an independent risk factor for higher relapse of death and that twice higher also the risk of death in these patients, younger patients with hormone receptor positive with worsening of QOL than in older patients. And these patients tend to have more severe symptoms and more activity impairment. Henceforth, the goal of treatment should be to maximize symptom control while we are maintaining quality of life and of course, extending their survival as much as we can. So the current treat treatment paradigm for hormone receptor positive HER2 negative advanced breast cancer has to be sequencing of endocrine treatment, targeted treatment and chemotherapy while prolonging patients' lives, also delaying disease progression and minimizing symptoms as much as we can. And Dr. and the previous lecturers have mentioned that all the guideline giving bodies like NCCN, ASCO, and the ESMO have recommended hormone, hormone treatment rather than chemotherapy for those not in visceral crisis. And in fact, the NCCN has recommended the first, first line treatment for premenopausal patients, hormone receptor positive or to negative metastatic breast cancer that it should be ovarian ablation or suppression plus endocrine treatment with or without CDK4-6 inhibitor. And this is also recommended for postmenopausal women, and that is echoed by the ESMO and even ASCO. So the standard first line of treatment is endocrine treatment of ovarian suppression. However, success of treatment is limited by drug resistance. And the previous lecturer has mentioned about drug resistance and that it is a very good treatment strategy to be hitting the CDK4-6 um, arena with our CDK4-6 inhibitors. And because these drugs have already shown to improve progression-free survival, so it really has become um, overcoming endocrine resistance. This has been elucidated, the mechanism of action of CDK4-6 inhibitors, so I won't repeat it. We already have palbociclib, ribociclib, and abemaciclib approved in the market. However, in the Philippines, I think abemaciclib will be coming in fourth quarter of this year, we all we only have palbociclib and ribociclib, and it is marketed as Crixana in the Philippines. So ribociclib is a potent and selective CDK4-6 inhibitor. It has a robust anti-tumor activity, and that was well elucidated, especially in this table by Dr. Joyce Ashraunasi, that significant overall survival in the three clinical trials, Mona Lisa 2, Mona Lisa 3, and Mona Lisa 7 has been shown with ribociclib. So we go to the updated results of Mona Lisa 7. You know that this is the first trial prospectively designed to assess the efficacy and safety of CDK4-6 inhibition in premenopausal women. This was a phase three randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial of 672 women aged 18 to 59 pre or perimenopausal at the time of study entry. And they had Histologically confirmed hormone receptor positive or negative, local regionally recurrent or metastatic breast cancer. So these patients either no prior endocrine treatment for advanced disease or one or less line of chemotherapy for advanced disease. The two arms were ribociclib in combination with tamoxifen or non-steroidal AI with 
an LHRH agonist and that is gasarilin as opposed to endocrine treatment with ovarian suppression. And the primary endpoint is progression-free survival. Secondary endpoint, among others, is overall survival. For the primary endpoint of progression-free survival, there's longer PFS in the combination of ribociclib and endocrine treatment of 44.2 months as opposed to 31 months only for the placebo arm and the hazard ratio is 0.68 and that means there's a 32% risk reduction in progression. What about for overall survival? So as mentioned by Dr. O'Shaughnessy that Mona Lisa 2 showed the longest mid and overall survival for postmenopausal women for Mona Lisa 2. And this is also the longest mid and overall survival shown for premenopausal patients for Mona Lisa 7 in that the combination of ribociclib and endocrine treatment showed a prolongation of mid and overall survival of 58.7 months. And that is um, almost five years as opposed to 48 months with placebo and endocrine treatment. Hazard ratio is 0.76. That means there's a 24% reduction in the risk of death. So this is after 53.5 months follow-up. What about for the, looking at the Mona Lisa 7 results for visceral disease? And indeed, there's also a higher overall survival for those receiving ribociclib and endocrine treatment. And there's a reported 30% reduction in the risk of death in patients with visceral disease. And the hazard ratio there is 0.698. What about for those patients with liver metastases? In Mona Lisa 7, there's about 25% of patients with liver mets, and there's a 47% reduction in the risk of death in the combination of ribociclib and endocrine treatment as opposed to endocrine treatment alone. So for those who are very young, less than 40 years old, there's a 10.8 month improvement in overall survival with a combination of ribociclib and endocrine treatment. 51.3 months in favor of the combination as opposed to 40.5 months for placebo. And that's a 35% relative risk reduction for death in patients less than 40 years old. The hazard ratio is 0.65. And what about for delayed time to chemotherapy? With, uh, as well, with Mona Lisa 7, that's the, the results for Mona Lisa 2 are also duplicated here in that there is a time to chemotherapy delay by four years in the ribociclib and endocrine treatment group, 50.9 months as opposed to 36.8 months for placebo and endocrine treatment. And longer chemotherapy free survival with maribociclib and endocrine treatment, 42.4 months as opposed to 26.4 months in placebo and endocrine. So, ribociclib treatment group reports a longer chemotherapy free survival with a 30% reduction in the risk of progressing to chemotherapy. What about for quality of life? Even with Mona Lisa 3, the results there has been duplicated also for quality of life in Mona Lisa 7 because quality of life for younger premenopausal patients has been maintained. So there's a higher quality of life for Mona Lisa 7 and even with Mona Lisa 3 and Mona Lisa 2. And there's also lesser pain and lesser fatigue for, pa for these patients receiving the combination arm. We know that it's a great challenge for these younger patients because they're, they're the more active one. They're still working. So at, at least it's a reprieve and a relief to know that there's higher quality of life if they receive the combination of Quixana, Ribociclib, and the endocrine treatment. So for safety, Ribociclib is reported to be well tolerated. As you know, Palbociclib and Ribociclib have... Um, Neutropenia rates of more than 40%. However, the incidence of febrile neutropenia is very low, less than 10%. However, with Pabociclib, because of the hematologic toxicity and because 40% of patients really require dose reduction, so the, the more preferred one is ribociclib. And QT prolongation is actually very, very rare, as uh, the other speakers have mentioned, and it's specific to doses only of um, more than 600 milligrams per day. But as you know, the... Ideal dose is only 600 milligrams per day. For abemocyclib, the GI toxicity of diarrhea is seen in 86.4% of cases. So ribociclib has a manageable safety profile and can be a potentially first-line treatment option in combination with endocrine treatment. 
and because ribociclibus improve overall survival, even for those with liver metastasis, has manageable safety and a very good quality of life benefit than other CDK4-6 inhibitor. So the, this is really a good option, especially for our case like this, who is pre menopausal with multiple visceral metastasis, not in visceral crisis. So ribociclib can be preferred over the other CDK4-6 inhibitor. So I'd like to summarize that the diagnosis of advanced breast, younger premenopausal women is associated with higher risk of relapse and death. And in Mona Lisa 7, with the updated results, this is the first and only dedicated premenopausal trial in nearly 20 years in the first line setting, reporting that ribociclib is a viable treatment option for premenopausal and perimenopausal patients with hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative advanced breast cancer. It shows a significant overall survival benefit after a median follow up of 53.5 months in the placebo. Clinical benefits for ribociclib for PFS is very is very clear and also for OS and improvement in quality of life. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Villegas, for the interesting case and the nice discussion. Now we'll go for the next, that is a panel discussion led by Dr. N.K. Varier. He is the director of MBR Cancer Center, Caricat. Over to Dr. Varier, please. Thank you, Dr. Poitam. Let me share my screen. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for, for this invitation. Uh, uh, let me see all the panelists. Uh, let me request all the panelists to start their video uh, so that uh, we can see each other. And joining us uh, today, uh, Dr. Vamsi Krishna from uh, Hyderabad and uh, Dr. Bhashankar uh, from Coimbatore. He is replacing. Uh, Dr. Uh, Niti, she is in town today. And uh, Dr. Bharat Rangrajan, uh, where is he? I am not able to see. Sir, uh, sir I am here, but uh, could you excuse me for just five minutes to ten minutes? I will switch on my video as soon as possible. Okay, sir. Okay. Some technical issue here, I will do it at once, sir. Yeah, Dr. Rajkumar Ramaswamy from, uh, again from Tamil Nadu, Madhuri. Thank you for joining us uh, today and uh, Dr. Joyce, uh, very good morning and uh, so happy to see you here and also uh, welcome uh, to this uh, uh, symposium on uh, uh, luminal uh, metastatic breast cancer. So uh, uh, coming back to the uh, uh, our uh, program today, I like the uh, caption, uh, living longer and living well. I like the concept very well, and uh, uh, thank you, so Navatis, for putting this uh, caption. So uh, the first question I would like to ask uh, to our Indian uh, uh, panelist, uh, Dr. Bamsi, uh, what is your goal of therapy uh, when you see a metastatic breast cancer? Okay. Uh, personally, I would go with an overall survival as one of the major goals. The other goals, of course, which would be looking at is a PFS, an overall response rate. And most importantly, a good quality of life. So, you know, we are greedy. We would want all of these to happen. But uh, certainly in a disease where you're expecting a long life, OS does matter to me. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Omsis. So, will you be looking at uh, uh, progression uh, the, or second PFS as well uh, in, uh, when you are uh, planning uh, your therapy? Omsis? Yeah. Yes, I would look at that as well. Because like That's I said, for me, the overall survival matters. And that overall survival will improve when you have a better PFS and a PFS too. Okay. So uh, again, uh, Dr. Kripa, what are your considerations uh, uh, in uh, when you see a metastatic breast cancer? We were talking about uh, uh, the various uh, clinical scenarios uh, here. And uh, uh, are there any subset of patients uh, for whom you won't prescribe uh, CDK4-6 inhibitors? I think uh, that's a very relevant uh, yeah, question. I think probably in our practice, I would probably look at dealing with oligometastatic breast cancers differently. Because I think there we would probably go in with the curative intent and we would probably go in with the anthracyclines and taxanes and give them the full course and look at a probable curative intent. So that's probably one entity where I wouldn't look at jumping on to CDK4-6 inhibitors. 
but uh, in all the other circumstances and probably you know there's now recent data to suggest that even in patients who have a visceral crisis you could lead in with probably cdk 46 inhibitors with an ai so i think uh, in all the other substance i mean like in all the other scenarios you could actually lead in with both but probably for, for me oligometastatic breast cancer alone i would probably uh, stick to the conventional therapy I think the, Dr. Joyce, you want, uh, you want to uh, contribute something uh, regarding the oligometastatic disease where uh, uh, Dr. Kripashankar wants to use only aromatase inhibitors or the uh, endocrine treatment alone. What is your opinion? Uh, you are on mute. Uh. For metastatic disease, you know, that is um, proven, your know, biopsy proven, but it's oligo metastatic disease, you know, somebody presenting de novo metastatic, but with oligo metastatic disease. Um, I would um, try for um, the deep, you know, the, the, the eradication of as much cancer in the body as possible to try to, um, you know, prolong survival as long as possible. You know, I um, I actually don't know that um, anthracycline and taxane and cyclophosphamide therapy is superior to um, CDK4-6 inhibitors in, in, in this setting. You know, um, I'm trying to think about various scenarios. You know, it, it probably would depend on the biology. If someone had a more highly proliferative luminal B-like breast cancer, and um, let's say you know she had oligometastatic disease, and you know one or two bone lesions, one or two uh, lung lesions, for example, or even even liver. If she perhaps if she were a luminal B biology, I would go the anthocycline, taxane, cyclophosphamide route, you know, and go that whole route. Now I would be bringing in a CDK four six inhibitor, however, for the patient because she was metastatic. I wouldn't do just um, endocrine therapy. I would go with ribocyclic because, again, of the survival um, advantage. If the biology, however, was like strongly ERPR positive with a lower key 67, let's say less than 20% or so, I'm not sure I would go with chemotherapy. Um, I think I'd be inclined to optimize endocrine therapy. Of course, you know, BSO if she's young, you know, uh, AI, ribocyclic, and um, and, but I would probably, in that case, go ahead and address the primary breast cancer as well. I tend to do that in an oligometastatic setting where I expect the systemic therapy to work for as long as possible. I really do think there is something about getting the, the body burden down as low as possible of, um, of breast cancer. Uh, in this situation where you've got just oligometastatic disease. So I do agree. I do agree that there is probably is a role for the anthracycline and the taxane and cyclophosphamide, particularly in the more aggressive type biology. Okay. So you will be uh, uh, looking at the biology and accordingly you will be selecting therapy, right? Thank you, yes. Tom. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Bharat, uh, are the treatment goals and standard of care uh, similar in premenopausal and postmenopausal patients? So, what all considerations you will uh, give uh, while selecting a CDK46 inhibitor in, the, in your clinics? Dr. Bharat? I think Bharat is uh, some uh, connected the question. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, what are your treatment goals uh, for treating pre and post menopausal women with advanced uh, breast cancer? Are they, uh, the, your goals will be similar and uh, the menopausal so will change your approach or anything? So? The goals will, of course, be similar. Of course, we will try to make the women um, uh, post menopausal either with uh, oophorectomies or with uh, ovarian suppression. The modality may change, but the goals remain same. Uh, I don't uh, really, I, overall survival, as Vamshi said, is very important, but I, I don't think I really focus so much on overall survival when I'm first seeing a de novo uh, breast cancer. Important if, uh, the, if you look at the data, the premenopausal women, we don't have much, uh, uh, only the, the recent, the, the update, uh, the Mona Lisa 7. Apart from the 7. Uh, we don't have... Uh, 
uh, any data to suggest the use of uh, CDK for six inhibitor, other CDK for six inhibitors, right? Uh, that is uh, true, sir. That is very true. But uh, in most of the women, we are making them uh, postmenopausal, and uh, the preferred choice after making them postmenopausal remains a ribociclib. But uh, uh, in the past, we have also used uh, palbociclib uh, as an alternative after making them uh, uh, postmenopausal. But the choice is usually ribociclib in these women. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Rajkumar, what are your what are the treatment challenges you face while treating uh, premenopausal women with advanced breast cancer? In um, premenopausal advanced, you usually tend to have a bulky disease, multiple metastases. Even though it may be an HR positive, they have very little accuracy disease. The oligometastatic bone alone disease is entirely different between the oligometastatic lung disease, oligometastatic liver. The biology differs. So I tend to use a CDK4 inhibitor, even if it's going to be a oligometastatic, if it is going to be a bone only metastatic. And the quality of life becomes a very prime uh, concern for me in a premenopausal. Uh, of course, you need to have an ovarian suppression also, but the quality of life matters. And, and I tend to use the CDK4 inhibitors if the uh, tumor burden is less, and if the tumor burden is going to be very high, then I try to achieve the um, rapid tumor reduction with the help of a, a chemotherapy. Probably they are at higher risk of uh, relapse and death because, because of the aggressive uh, behavior and greater uh, symptoms. Uh, and, uh, and there can be uh, impaired activity as well. And as you said, uh, uh, all of this will affect the quality of life, right? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, you can, uh, I... Uh, I want to get the opinion from uh, Dr. Joyce. Uh, we were, 10 years back, we were not talking about uh, the overall survival at all in a metastatic breast cancer. Uh, but uh, uh, now we are uh, in a position to discuss about uh, the OS uh, uh, as an important factor in, con in considering the or choosing the, uh, the treatment for a metastatic breast cancer. How did it happen actually? And what is the evolution uh, uh, which uh, made us to think like the, uh, the uh, OS as uh, one of the key points in uh, selecting this therapy? Well, you know, I think a lot of us who have been around for decades, I'm just thinking back, you know, we used to be able to count on just a few fingers the um, number of phase three trials that had a positive impact on survival. Um, you know, going back to the docetaxel, capecitabine, paclitaxel, gemcitabine. It was very, very difficult to show survival. And, you know, we have had more success, certainly in the HER2 positive arena. We've seen several positive survival trials. Chemotherapy has still remained, you know, um, uh, un unusual in terms of survival. We've seen with the checkpoint inhibitors, but particularly um, now, pembrolizumab, we've seen an improvement in survival. But as we think about endocrine therapy, you know, even the, the frontline letrozole versus tamoxifen, the curve split for the first two years in terms of survival. But then patients who got tamoxifen, they switched over to get an aromatase inhibitor. And so the curves came back together again. So the study was not significant in terms of survival. So we just hadn't seen first line survival we just didn't have it. We used to think, well, it was because they lived so long. Or they lived so long. There were so many subsequent therapies. It was just difficult to show survival. But the CDK4-6 inhibitors have made such a huge impact on progression-free survival. You know, going from nine months median, um, I guess, in the, in the, fir in the first line, um, letrozole versus tamoxifen was 11 months median PFS for letrozole. And now we're, you know, well beyond two years median PFS. So with that kind of impact on PFS, we're seeing these, this, you know, prolonged impact on survival. And um, it's just really new for us that we've been able to really even talk about uh, survival. Of course, no question in our mind, that's what our patients care about. When somebody's diagnosed with metastatic disease, that's the first thing, of course, they think about is how long will I live? They want to live well, of course, they don't want to live you know, with substantial toxicity from the treatments either, but they do want to live, of course, as long as possible. And um, we, our patients continue to hope for additional therapies that are going to continue to prolong their life. But we just haven't had that, um, that data in the first line 
or any uh, endocrine therapy um, directed type therapies, survival has been very, very elusive in that group of patients. So it really is a, it is a really, you know, important impact that we're seeing now with ribocyclob acro across the, the you know, three settings, the metastatic setting. Yeah, so deviation from the chemotherapy to at the more of a targeted therapy and in, form, in, the, in the form of uh, hormones and then later uh, the uh, identifying the hormonal resistance and then subsequently uh, modifying the hormonal response. These are the probably uh, the factors which led to the uh, the development of uh, looking at uh, OIS as the main goal in our treatment for metastatic breast cancer, right? Yes. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, so, uh, uh, so now the, uh, the we, we are just talking about the overall survival and overall survival reflects the balance between meaningful clinical benefit and toxicity. So my question is to uh, Dr. Illy, uh, uh, so do you think uh, when you are uh, selecting a therapy which has got uh, longer overall, uh, sali uh, overall survival, uh, do you believe improved overall survival without com compromising quality of life is an achievable treatment goal in metastatic breast cancer? In the past, we have seen whenever we are uh, uh, selecting a therapy which, is, which prolongs the overall survival, it can be done only at the expense of quality of life. So what do you think? Uh, Definitely. Um, now it's very nice to be practicing medical oncology because of the wealth of data that all of these CDK4-6 inhibitors, especially ribocyclic, bringing into the plate the overall survival benefit, PFS benefit. And it's very easy to convince patients already to spend for their lives. You know, it's not an easy drug to buy. It's very expensive, especially here in the Philippines at the economics, it's really a challenge. But because we are already treating all of these cancers chronically, that they live longer. So it's it's very meaningful that, um, that they have quality of life. They're able to live life to the fullest. And really there's a promise of overall survival. So yeah, definitely. You have showed this, uh, the longest ever uh, median overall survival uh, of 58.7 months after a median follow-up of 53.5 uh, months with the uh, uh, RIBO. And uh, uh, at the same time, uh, the quality of life uh, was maintained longer. So that's an uh, achievable target. And uh, uh, this is being uh, experienced in our real practice as well. So the real world data also confirms the, this Acquire uh, the maintaining uh, maintenance of quality of life, right? So uh, uh, again, uh, uh, the uh, Dr. Bharat, you are back and uh, you are settled now. So I yes, can uh, uh, ask you uh, this question: uh, The ribocyclic reported longest ever median uh, overall survival for premenopausal patients. Uh, that is what the Mona Lisa Seven uh, results uh, tell us. So uh, uh, do you think that this overall survival can be achieved with other CDK4-6 inhibitors as well? Uh, or it, it is only with uh, uh, this uh, ribocyclic? I know that uh, uh, Nawat is it's a very, uh, 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 scolding me, but uh, I have to ask this question. There is a, that's a very difficult question because there are two aspects to this question. One is uh, the uh, preferential uh, CDK K4 versus CDK6 inhibition with, uh, you know, more CDK6 inhibition in the ribociclib and maybe even more in the abimaciclib. That is one part vis-a-vis -vis the uh, palbociclib. Uh, the second part is the slight differences in the trial with, you know, the number of patients who have received prior chemotherapy and small differences in the uh, trial population. So we really don't know whether, you know, we can cross uh, uh, trial uh, compare and we don't have so much of premenopausal data with the other two uh, CDK4-6 inhibitors as much as we have with uh, uh, ribociclib. So unless we have extremely similarly designed trials, we really can't look at uh, the differential uh, between CDK6 and CDK4 inhibition and the impact. So as of now, we have to accept the data as it is and, you know, accept that maybe, yes, ribociclib has the maximum uh, benefit in this group in the clinical setting. Uh, whether it would all, uh, you know, be the same if we do another trial, uh, 
really remains very difficult Let us for ask me the to... same question to Dr. Joyce. Uh, Dr. Joyce, what do you think? But, uh, technically speaking, all the CDK46 inhibitors should be uh, working uh, uh, in the same way, but uh, we see the uh, overall survival improvement and the data to support on the ribocycle. What do you think the reason is? <clears throat> well, palbocycle, as has been just said and has said, been said many times, with the equipotent inhibition of CDK4 and 6, you get more myelosuppression. And so neutropenia becomes um, an issue and patients get dose reductions, but it's just not as potent against CDK4. And so I think that's a bit of an issue with palbocyclib. And the, um, the adjuvant trials were very, very disappointing with palbocyclib. They were, they were strikingly surprising, um, but they were negative. And so um, I think it is where, where you can inhibit CDK4 more is better. Now, abemocyclib is a different animal. It has a broader mechanism of action. It probably does get some CDK2. It gets some CDK9. And so I do use abemocyclib for the most endocrine therapy resistant patients. You know, patients, for example, who start in on adjuvant AI therapy and then they recur in their liver within 18 months and they have huge liver metastasis. That's a primary endocrine therapy resistant patient. Ribocyclib has data in the primary endocrine therapy resistant population as well. So if you just look at the data, you'd say there's no difference between ribo and abema. However, in my clinical practice experience, I have found abemocyclib to be the best in terms of this really resistant um, disease and particularly liver disease. It's very, very life-threatening. Outside of that setting, however, I don't use abemocyclib in the metastatic setting. When I think there's going to be endocrine therapy sensitivity, I use ribocyclib as my primary, as, as, as my first choice. Um, I'm not going to use palbocyclib because unfortunately the accumulated data are not looking good with that, with that, um, with that agent compared to ribocyclib. So I will use ribocyclib when I would used to use palbocyclib, but it's the endocrine therapy, you know, sensitive population, which is most of our patients, about 85% of our patients have endocrine therapy sensitive disease. So that's how I see it. I think the, um, the differential inhibition of CDK4 is very important when it comes to comparing ribo and palbo. So in the first line option, you will definitely go for uh, RIBO uh, because of the overall survival benefit uh, and the differential uh, inhibition. So is there any uh, other choice for the second line uh, therapy? For second line, after after uh, first line CDK46? No, uh, the, uh, those who have failed after the first line, uh, first endocrine therapy, and then, uh, so second line options. No, I see. Uh, with the um, with the CDK four six inhibitors, they have well, received I mean, adjuvant uh, hormones. They have ad uh, received adjuvant hormone, and they are uh, having a relapse in the uh, and coming back as metastatic breast cancer. Hormone sensitive uh, metastatic breast cancer. Um, they had the protocol treatment for a, a early breast cancer, and they would have received uh, five years or ten years of uh, hormone treatment, and then subsequently relapsing with the uh, same biology like uh, hormone sensitive disease. Yeah, um, those are patients that would have been eligible for Mona Lisa three. I'm uh, sorry, Mona Lisa seven and Mona Lisa two. So those patients have survival advantages with ribocyclin. So I, I think that's a, a clear situation for ribocyclin. Ribocyclib. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, what, uh, probably ribocyclib uh, is, uh, uh, has got the longest uh, overall survival, which we have seen with uh, the Mona Lisa 7 trial and better quality of life and uh, has got a better safety profile. That makes uh, the choice of the first line uh, choice of uh, ribocyclib. Uh, and uh, uh, also, uh, uh, I think uh, Dr. Joyce has already mentioned about this, uh, the differential uh, and preferential selective, uh, selectivity uh, for CDK4 uh, compared to the CDK6. Uh, so my question is whether uh, if the patient is uh, focusing with uh, uh, on uh, another CDK4-6 where the uh, uh, preferential inhibition is not there, can we uh, switch over to uh, ribocyclic? Dr. Joyce? 
Um, so, for example, if someone had started on palbociclib, should we yeah. switch them over to um, ribociclib? Um, you know, generally speaking, I would um, stay with what the patient is on. I haven't been switching my palbo patients over to ribo if they're doing okay, you know, on, on palbociclib. Some patients, I do not like a lot of dose reductions. Um, I will reluctantly get down from 125 to 100 on palbo, um, but I really like to get these drugs in. They're so important for patients. So if somebody is developing substantial neutropenia and they have been on palbo, see now I'm choosing ribo. So these would be patients that were on palbo a while back because I've been using ribo now for a while since we've had this survival data, but I would switch over to ribo for sure if they were really running into substantial neutropenia. Thank you. Uh, and Kripa, uh, the dose reductions, uh, uh, we, may, we may have to do the dose reductions whenever we see prolonged neutropenia as uh, highlighted by Dr. Joyce in her talk. Uh, so uh, is it a concern in your clinical practice uh, when, whenever you see that the patient is not tolerating the recommended dose and uh, you have to uh, reduce the dose? And are you concerned about the uh, 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 compromise on over, uh, the OS benefit uh, uh, if you are making a dose reduction? So, so I think it really matters. I mean, like it's all a question of the benefit versus the risk-benefit ratio, as we would call it. So I think if a patient has got profound neutropenia or if he's got any other toxicity which mandates me to bring down on the dose, I think it's, it's fair enough for us to do that. And I, I, I mean, like as you've shown the data rightly there here as well, I think the dose reduction actually doesn't hasn't compromised on the overall survival benefit as well. And the other thing is, you know, as far as choosing between the CDK46 inhibitors, I think we'll have to look at, you know, the toxicity profile as well. And again, the financial toxicity, the patient post uh, pays support programs as well. And I, I mean, like, I think uh, using one CDK or the other, I think as, as Dr. Joyce rightly pointed out, probably Abima is the one CDK46, which actually stands out in that it's approved as monotherapy as well, post two lines of therapy in the hormone, in the hormone receptor positive setting. And also it's one that is dosed continuously. It's got better CNS penetration, but also the side chains are different in that it's, yeah. it's got two extra fluorine atoms as well. So I think, you know, you could also make a case definitely as Dr. Joyce pointed out for abimacyclib. And before I end, I think I, I just want to point out one thing about the overall survival, you know, uh, thing that we were discussing earlier, OS versus PFS. I think there's something in, uh, you know, clinical cancer research, which we call the McNamara fallacy, which is Robert McNamara was the US Secretary of Defense. He believed that numbers were everything. He believed in, you know, substantiating that with only numbers. But I think, you know, uh, this is a class benefit that we're seeing with the CDK46 inhibitors. Ribo is probably the first in its class to show that benefit. And it's only a matter of time before the others also are able to show that. And by others, I mean Abima as well. So, but I think uh, Dr. Joyce here has uh, clearly explained why uh, Ribo is superior in terms of OIS. So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kripa. The, the, uh, I think the dose reduction does not compromise the OIS benefit as seen by uh, in the Monarisa 3 and uh, the Monarisa 7 studies. And uh, uh, I'm sure, Dr. Eli, uh, you have anything to uh, add uh, uh, regarding this, uh, the dose reduction uh, and uh, its uh, effect on uh, the OIS benefit. Dr. Eli? Yeah, I think for public clip, the reason why the adjuvant trials did not prosper is really because of the much of the dose reductions in those adjuvant trials. And we are awaiting with much gusto the Natalie trial because it's dose at 400 milligrams and supposedly ribociclib. It won't matter if you have reduced it from 600 to 400. So we are awaiting that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Joyce, th this is something which uh, we, we all would like to hear from you. Uh, in, on selecting the CDK46 inhibitor, uh, depending upon the clinical scenario. So we have uh, seen uh, people coming with uh, uh, high disease burden, high metastatic volume, and those, especially those who are having the number of metastatic sites more than three. Uh, uh, similarly, the uh, very short uh, uh, DFS after the, uh, uh, for the first line, the first line endocrine therapy, and also, uh, again, uh, depending upon the menopausal status. So can you just uh, uh, highlight us on uh, the various points which uh, uh, will decide uh, the selection of uh, therapy, uh, especially uh, uh, for those who are having high volume disease, but not uh, uh, at the risk of uh, uh, visceral crisis? 
Yeah. Um, so it was very interesting. I, I think, you know, this issue of endocrine therapy sensitivity versus resistance is very important. And Nick Turner's New England Journal of Medicine paper with Paloma 3 was very interesting. It showed a 10 month improvement in survival with palbo in endocrine therapy sensitive patients per the ESMO definition, which is just to refresh is patients who um, had more than two years of adjuvant endocrine therapy before their disease uh, recurred. That's endocrine therapy sensitivity or in the metastatic setting, patients who had at least six months of benefit of metastatic endocrine therapy benefit that was, and then they progressed, that was considered sensitive. So resistant is very, very stringently defined as you know recurrence within two years of starting adjuvant endocrine therapy or no benefit at all in the metastatic setting. But palbo was inactive, inactive in those patients. Okay. So then you look at Mona Lisa 3 and Mona Lisa 7. It's a very nice analysis um, by Dr. Denise Yardley, um, looking at those with um, primary endocrine therapy resistance per the ESMO definition in Mona Lisa 3 and 7. And interestingly, um, those are both favorable for um, ribocyclin in, in, in the individual studies and then put together. And the, and the same is true for um, abemocyclin in both Monarch 2 and Monarch 3. And um, the thing about ribocyclin is that even in with regard to overall survival, you still see overall survival positive impact. Whereas with abemocyclin, we only have survival so far in Monarch 2. We don't have it yet for Monarch 3, but you do see it. You do see survival. So you've got both abema and ribo with very good data showing effectiveness in the primary endocrine therapy resistant population. And then heavy tumor burden, of course, liver is probably the exemplar in terms of just heavy burden we worry about the, uh, the most. And um, there we see as well in Mona Lisa 3 and 7, we see benefit in survival in patients with liver metastasis. So that's really very encouraging um, as well. So ribocyclob really does look to be very highly effective. I guess it's the potency against CDK4. And Will you sequence the endocrine partner in these uh, situations? Um, I, I basically change, I mean, I, I don't keep the CDK4-6 inhibitor going and sequence endocrine therapies. I don't do that, is that if that's what you mean. Yeah, uh, uh, the, between uh, the aromatase inhibitor and the uh, fulvestrin, uh, which is your uh, uh, primary choice. In the very first line, I, I basically follow the eligibility criteria for the phase three trials. So that I, I use the AI first line unless they're recurring on adjuvant AI or very soon after stopping it, um, I use the, um, the AI and then I use fulvestrin only if they've recurred on adjuvant AI. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. And this is one something which uh, uh, all of us should uh, uh, pay attention to. Uh, this the ESMO magnitude of clinical benefit scale score of five is given uh, for uh, you know, RIBO uh, based on the various studies. So this is something which uh, uh, all of uh, all of us should uh, consider. Uh, it's not only the uh, the overall survival benefit; uh, it, it's the quality of life as well. So uh, uh, I think uh, the majority of questions uh, we have discussed, uh, especially about uh, uh, the, the OS benefit and the quality of uh, uh, life data. And uh, this has been uh, highlighted uh, by Dr. Joyce. So coming back, coming to the safety, in terms of safety, which is potentially the most uh, uh, safest, uh, Dr. Rajkumar, uh, uh, have you uh, seen any major concerns uh, in terms of toxicity in your clinical practice? Uh, before answering that, could I talk on the, the previous questions, if you permit me? Um, the sequencing of the... CDK4 inhibitors, patients who are progressing on one line of uh, CDK4 inhibitor, I prefer not to go over the second line. And uh, Dr. Eli has got a very interesting strategy of uh, spacing. Instead of giving a seven day uh, treatment free, she has got a, to reduce, instead of reducing their dose, she has got a 10 day. That's very relevant in a, a resource constraint setting like uh, Philippines. You also have the resource constraint setting. Uh, that strategy is a 
very interesting one i'd like to try uh, dr elise and uh, she was very successful in uh, preventing the um, toxicity with the help of uh, uh, spacing instead of 7 to 10 days that's a very interesting one which interests me a lot and uh, the, the safety aspect um, ribo we have minority of the patients do go for mylas operation with the neutropenia and uh, um, uh, dose reductions or maybe a dose phasing and um, these can be managed very efficiently by giving a treatment free interval as minimum as possible in order to uh, not to compromise on the um, overall survival of the pfs so this is manageable toxicity i do come across patients with mylas operations with the um, neutropenia and we try to manage and we managed very successfully Vamsi, do you come across any QT major uh, significant QT prolongation in your clinical practice? Honestly, no. Uh, I have, in fact, only thing I have encountered long QT series in a trial setting when we had to be forced to check ECG for everybody. We surprisingly found, you know, two three people who were ineligible because they had QTC prolonged. But in routine practice, I actually don't really insist on ECG beyond the second or the third cycle. It's usually done only in the first two, three cycles, and then we start reducing it. And okay. coming to the other point of toxicities, I think to add to what everyone has said, the one area where I'm a little cautious is elderly you know, women, 75, 80, with very frail bones. They come in a wheelchair, you're afraid they'll just fall on and fracture. That's where I actually start with the lower dose and then escalate later. And I had a bad experience. I mean, I'd seen a patient who had a bad experience with uh, mm -hmm. one of the CDK46. She had a prolonged neutropenia and thrombocytopenia for almost one and a half months. Because it was started the full dose. So mm -hmm. that's the only thing to add on to what has been discussed. So your strategy is to start with a lower dose and then uh, to go for so Again, not for everybody, only for this very select group yes, of elderly, frail people. Uh, yeah. Okay. Very, yeah. Very good. Uh, very good. So uh, the, Dr. Joyce has already mentioned about uh, the QT prolongation, not a very significant clinical uh, situation and uh, say, I think the Abima Cyclib, uh, we all experience uh, this uh, side effect uh, that is the diarrhea. Uh, and uh, Dr. Eli, uh, the, the, uh, do you think that uh, uh, the two important parameters uh, 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 regarding the uh, uh, two important parameters regarding uh, ribocyclib is uh, important in the clinical practice, like uh, it's uh, uh, the post progression outcomes uh, uh, apart from the overall survival, especially when uh, you see that uh, uh, the uh, time to progression and uh, uh, time to, uh, the, to introduction of chemotherapy as well as uh, time to deterioration. What is the question again? Sorry. Yeah. So, so uh, the improved overall survival, as well as uh, the uh, uh, also that uh, makes uh, uh, an important uh, issue like uh, the post progression. So, how the the uh, do you think that uh, the uh, important uh, parameters like time to uh, disease progression uh, or the time to uh, the uh, introduction of chemotherapy as well as uh, time to uh, the deterioration are uh, uh, important uh, yeah. when you compare the CDK46 inhibitors. Definitely, definitely. Especially with the uh, Mona Lisa 7, there's even like a seven year um, delay in patients receiving chemotherapy. And that is a very welcome um, addition for patients to, to embark on treatments because many of them still are very, you know, they, it's a stigma for them to start on anything that they are uncertain about. But this one really will bring into the table again that cancer, it, it's, in, it's not a death sentence. And then if they don't really like chemotherapy, and this is the answer to that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So uh, def there's a, a definitely a, a ch change in paradigm shift uh, uh, more in favor of uh, ribocyclic, uh, especially with uh, the robust data uh, came from uh, the Mona Lisa 7 and uh, the Mona Lisa 2. So uh, the, now uh, people are looking at uh, all uh, these parameters like uh, the TTD and the uh, TTC, the time to uh, case starting of chemotherapy. So, uh, the, uh, what are your choices uh, when uh, somebody is uh, uh, progressing after CDK46 inhibitors? Uh, Dr. Bharat, uh, what is your practice? So, 
uh, we heard Satya in the beginning and then we heard the other uh, thing. Uh, if the, uh, after CD4-6 inhibitors, if there is TIC3-CA mutation, uh, the ideal choice uh, is of course alpilisib. Um, I don't know whether I have been unlucky or whether it's, I don't know the reason, but I have been extremely, uh, I have found alpilisib to be extremely difficult uh, drug. Uh, I have had patients who have gone on to ICU with uh, sepsis and uh, diabetic ketoacidosis. I have had patients who have had developed renal failure. Um, it's been a tough drug for me. It's not that I'm not using the drug, but it's been a tough drug. So uh, for anybody who is a little frail, who has um, comorbidities, whose uh, uh, HbA1c is anything about 6.5, uh, I try to prefer um, Evrolimus plus uh, Examestane uh, nowadays uh, because, but I still uh, have patients on alpilis, uh, alpilis. It's a, uh, it's, I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm using it wrong. I don't know, but it's been a tough drug for me. It is uh, not like, not like CDK4-6 inhibitors. Uh, no. To answer your previous questions, that that class of drug has been very easy to use. And like Dr. Ellie says, we can just prolong the drug by, you know, drug interval by seven days or 10 days. Even the diarrhea with Abima has been easy to manage. But alpilisib, unfortunately, has been a tough, tough okay. drug for me. Okay. So it's a, a, a different uh, clinical situation uh, here. Uh, one of my patients uh, asked me uh, that he, she is not experiencing any hyperglycemia at all. So uh, uh, she is asking whether the drug is working or not. So that's a situation. So totally different situation. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, people ask such a funny question. Uh, so uh, one more question to Dr. Joyce. That it's one important consideration. Uh, we all know that uh, uh, intrapatient uh, heterogeneity in, uh, in the hormone uh, receptors. So uh, how will you take up uh, this but, uh, this question? Uh, whenever uh, a patient has got more than three side uh, metastasis, and uh, do you think that uh, all patient, all areas will be equally uh, sensitive to hormones? That's an interesting question. You know, um, generally speaking, we have um, a, a concordant result, you know, um, um, Ellie's um, presentation of her patient who had the, you know, de novo metastatic disease. She really responded um, in bone. She responded in breast. Her liver kind of stabilized. But, you know, the liver takes longer. We know that from previous data that it can take um, 16 weeks before you see a real response in liver. It can just take longer. Um, so, but generally speaking, we see concordant benefit. It just, uh, it's unusual to see frank progression and, you know, mixed response with frank progression in some sites and um, and not in others. Um, I think the heterogeneity, heterogeneity comes up because some um, sites will go into a CR, right? And then others will just have a partial response. So there'll be some cells that we can only get into a G1. We can't eradicate them, but at least they're just sitting sitting there. So the heterogeneity is a big a big issue. I totally agree with you. If one area is not responding as expected, uh, do you recommend a biopsy from that uh, lesion? Yes, um, I think that's an interesting consideration because the uh, mechanisms of resistance that come out in the context of AI inhibition, including with CDK4-6 inhibitors, with APABEC, you know, that mechanism of DNA repair um, deficiency of APABEC you know, you really get all kinds of new mutations coming out, such as HER2 mutations, ESR1 mutations. And now we're getting more that we can do for those. So I think it is an interesting, I do tend to biopsy quite a bit. You see tDNA quite a bit as well to try to find these mutations. If you find discordance in one of these lesions, uh, what will you uh, do with it? Well, I will consider SRS, you know, for example. If someone, if a woman's really responding beautifully and one liver met is growing, I'll leave her on her systemic therapy. I'll, I won't change the CDK4-6 inhibitor. I'll do an S SBRT, you know, for example, to that liver met. So I, I do do that um, sometimes if she's progressing just in breast disease, for example, but the systemic disease is controlled, you know, we'll, we'll do surgery to the breast and remove that, that one lesion. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. So one more question about uh, one more clinical scenario. Uh, we have a couple of patients, uh, two, at least two of them uh, in the last uh, two months. Uh, he, they were found to have uh, uh, incidentally detected metastatic breast cancer and uh, very well fitting into the luminal metastatic breast cancer and started on ribocyclib plus uh, 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 aromatase inhibitor combination. After six months of therapy, the re-evaluation didn't show any appreciable change at all, uh, uh, radiologically, but still they are asymptomatic. So what will you uh, uh, suggest for such patients? I would you continue their therapy. Um, I don't change unless there's frank progression because clinical benefit, which is defined, of course, as six months or longer of uh, disease stability, um, is associated with the same survival as having a partial response. We've known that a long time, as you know, for decades, we've known that about endocrine therapy. So I would not change anything for the patient. They were asymptomatic, totally asymptomatic at the beginning as well as uh, now. So, mm -hmm. uh, so it can be taken as kind of stable disease. Do you recommend any uh, pic 3 c mutation uh, in such a uh, situation, clinical scenario? I would, I would sequence the cancer. I'd want to know about a PIK3CA mutation. You know, we know that the CDK4-6 inhibitors work in the context of, CD, of PIK3CA mutations. However, we also know they tend to be um, metastatic cancers that are more difficult to treat in terms of duration of benefit. PIK3CA mutations is a clear mechanism of resistance to CDK4-6 inhibitors. They still work, but that tends to be a mechanism of resistance. And so, but with stable disease, I don't argue with stable disease. I don't really trust our imaging to be that perfect, to be honest with you. You know, you can still have disease, but then on a PET scan, it'll be totally inactive. That's good, but that's, I'm fine with that. Thank you, thank you so much. So uh, one more uh, uh, question, when would you prefer to test uh, PIK3 mutation at the beginning of uh, therapy or uh, at the time of uh, progression? All other uh, questions have been already discussed by Dr. Dutta. Sorry. Well, I think um, when, just in terms of conserving resources, I think that um, it probably makes the most sense to look for PIK3CA mutations upon progression on CDK46 because we saw from Paloma 3, Nick Turner's um, data that are published now, the 10% of patients who on CT DNA did not have a PIK3CA mutation when they started fulvestrin plus minus palbociclib, when they when their disease progressed, 10% more patients were found to have a pic 3 c mutation. I don't know that it was acquired. It was just that it was happened to be found maybe more metastatic burden at the time of disease progression than at diagnosis. The pic 3 c mutations are truncal. They occur early in the course of the development of a primary breast cancer. So you can go back to the primary tissue. In fact, if your CT DNA is negative, we should go back to tissue and sequence it. Um, but the primary breast cancer is good because it's a larger sample. It's a larger sample. If it's just a core biopsy, there may be some heterogeneity of expression, but you know, it, it is a truncal mutation. However, the PIK3C mutation can be acquired. Any of these point mutations in the context of an APABEC, you know, tend, if, if, the, if the carcinogenesis was driven by APABEC, then, then these cancers are going to be picking up all kinds of point mutations. So it can be acquired. And so that's why I tend to do it. If, I, if, I only, if you gave me only one chance to look for a pic mutation, I would do it upon progression after CDK4-6. So I don't miss acquired mutations, both by ctDNA or uh, NGS of a, of a biopsy obtained after progression on CDK4-6. In my own practice, I tend to do it in first-line metastatic disease. I'll biopsy the metastasis. I'll sequence it as long as it's not bone. If it's bone only, I'll have to go back to the primary and I'll look for ctDNA, but that's because I have the luxury of being able to get another CT DNA upon progression on the CDK46. But if I didn't have the luxury of doing it twice, I would do it after CDK46 so I can both pick up the, you know, the um, the de novo, uh, the intrinsic mutation that was there from the beginning, as well as any um, acquired mutations that I might miss otherwise. Excellent, excellent. Uh, so 
wonderful uh, answer, uh, Dr. Jaisi. Thank you so much. So uh, the uh, Alpali, uh, I think that a couple of slides are on Alpalisib. Uh, Dr. Dattatre has already mentioned, uh, dis discussed in detail. So I think uh, uh, we will not be discussing much about that. And uh, 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 but let me ask uh, my uh, other panel members: What are the ideal considerations before you uh, when you are choosing uh, Alpalisib? Dr. Kriban, yeah, what is your concern uh, when you are choosing, apart from the uh, doctor? Uh, uh... So, so I think uh, we've uh, heard Dr. Bharat also touch upon the issue with hyperglycemia. So I think in patients who are already diabetic with the poor glycemic control, I'd be very cautious. And especially we'll have to monitor their sugars very carefully. Apart from that, the stomatitis, the rash, the diarrhea, I mean, like they're all a class side effect of all these PI3K, AKTM, TOR pathway inhibitors. So I think all of those would be the ideal considerations for me before I actually start a patient on Alplus. Uh, Dr. Eli, uh, what, what is your uh, practice? Uh, in, uh... Since we don't have alpalisib in the country, we only have it as compassionate use. So I've been able to test patients because it was under our diagnostic study. So we test all patients who are hormone receptor positive to negative in the context of that study. But now we already have pic 3 ca testing. So personally, I test upon progression from CDK46. Okay. So when you are, uh, when your patients are progressing after the CD, uh, CDK46 inhibitor, uh, you are choice of therapy would be uh, chemotherapy or uh, uh, you have everolimus plus uh, exmastain combination or what? Yes, either that, everolimus, exmastain, or if they are pic 3 ca mutated and then alpalisib and um, chemotherapy will always be there. Okay, okay. So uh, I think, yeah. Maria, sir, can I just ask yeah, Dr. Better, Joyce? Please. Uh, Dr. Joyce or Shwini is your question because uh, from, you know, the last few years, uh, we have been using a lot of everolimus rather than alpalisib because of cost and availability. Uh, and uh, of late, I, we have also, because the PIC3CA mutation was available on, you know, we could do it for everyone. Uh, I, I did get all my patients tested, you know, uh, because there was a coupon availability for testing the uh, tumor sample as simple as that was free. Now, I found, uh, you know, that the patients who had the PIC3CA mutations actually responded extremely well, uh, more than a year uh, responses with Everolimus. And the ones who uh, did not have a PIC3CA with Everolimus, responses have been uniformly bad, less than six mm -hmm. months, sometimes as much as three months. Uh, so this is something that I noted, but it's very random in the sense that, you know, the testing was at one time point. And they were all randomly on Everlimus for a longer time, shorter time, or whatever. Uh, what is Dr. Joyce's uh, situation? Uh, you know, sort of advice, you know, on that. Oh, sorry, insight on that. The There's data actually from Bolero 2 showing that the Everlimus works both in PIC3CA mutant and PIC3CA wild type. Um, and that makes sense because there's so many different ways, of course, to to drive that um, pathway. So um, that's in, you're in, you're, it's interesting what you, you found. I'll, I bet your patients would still benefit from alpelicib having benefited from Everolimus because, of course, Everolimus only blocks Torque 1. And so um, it's very easy when you block just Torque 1, then IRS no longer inhibits AKT. A IRS stops inhibiting AKT and you get, you get escape to AKT. So um, I bet you um, the, the, uh, if they've got a, you know, when you got a pic 3 mutation, I bet you they'd still benefit from um, Alpelis. If I have such a patient who um, had uh, node positive, ER positive disease, and she had a disease free interval about five years or so after chemo and AI, she was premenopausal. She had a BSO, had AI, came back five years later. And she had a variety of treatments in the metastatic setting. She was generally, she only had plural based disease. That's all she's ever had is plural based disease. So that's real ER driven disease, but we didn't have alpelisib. And so I gave her Everolimus and she benefited, but then she went on to some, some chemotherapies and, and uh, CDK4-6 inhibitors. And then she was pretty heavily pretreated, but still an excellent performance status. But the cancer has got a PIC3CA mutation. 
And she has been on alpelacid for like four years. So when you've got real ER driven disease and she's already had everolimus and she benefited, but she's on, she's on alpelacid. I started at um, 300. She lost about 30 pounds. She was so happy. But then I said, we got to stop this weight loss. We got to stop this. So I went down to 250 and she stayed on 250 for like four years. She's had the beautiful quality of life. So this can be a really, really good drug for the right patients. And she she just never had hyperglycemia. So that's really good. But anyway, I think I I, I think that um, Everolimus works whether you're a pictorial mutant or not. And um, but I would not preclude the use of alpelacid in such patients. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Uh... I think we had a wonderful discussion and uh, uh, we had uh, discussed almost all the points uh, uh, regarding the day-to-day uh, -day practice when, you are, when we are dealing with uh, metastatic breast cancer, uh, especially uh, the, uh, the luminal uh, type of uh, metastatic breast cancer. Uh, Dr. Pavitran, you have any questions uh, from the uh, uh, participants? Uh, not yet. Anything about the newer certs, oral certs, Dr. Joycey, the lacestrin and all? Yeah, the, um, the lacestrin data are yeah. very interesting. I think um, they look like they're not going to overcome endocrine therapy resistance because if we look at the curves of, you know, fulvestrin versus lacestrin, you know, for example, in the Emerald trial, there's a, there's a considerable progression right away. And so it doesn't overcome endocrine therapy resistance in these later line patients, but then the curve splits. So the endocrine therapy sensitive patients are doing a lot better with l So I guess that um, better um, covalent binding, you know, you can get much better uh, bioavailability with the oral surge than you can with fulvestrin. So just better inhibition of the estrogen receptor, better destruction of the estrogen receptor is going to control, you know, endocrine therapy sensitive disease for a longer period of time. It's just going to be interesting to see what these agents can do earlier line of therapy, um, both in endocrine therapy sensitive and more resistant patients. But I do think it's going to be a nice um, addition if, you know, of course, it's all going to depend on cost and availability, of course. But in, um, I think in the U.S., patients will um, uh, be, be treated preferentially with oral surds compared to fulvestrin because of the um, emerald data once it becomes available. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, we will conclude the session. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Joyce, for your, especially for your patience. And uh, you were so kind uh, to explain all the uh, questions uh, we have put forward. And uh, it was a nice experience. Uh, also, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Eli, as well, uh, for your participation and the nice interaction. And, uh, and hope to see you all uh, for the coming ASCO, uh, Dr. Joyce. Uh, uh, we will surely meet. Uh, 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 once again, I thank all the panel members uh, who have actively participated. And uh, uh, on behalf of all my co-panelists, I thank uh, Novartis for this opportunity. And I also thank uh, Dr. Pavitran for uh, chairing uh, uh, the session. Thank you all. And uh, back to uh, Novartis. Now you, I invite Dr. Kripashankar for the concluding remarks. I think we've just had a wonderful, uh, you know, academic feast. I can say that, with and even especially with the IPL going on, especially over a weekend as well. So I think you know I must wholeheartedly thank everyone who's logged in today and made this such a wonderful success. And uh, thank you so much. And I'd also like to thank our sponsors, Novartis, for with this wonderful academic initiative. And with that, I'll say, uh, wishing everyone a very happy weekend as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Jai. you very much. Bye-bye. Dr. Krupa Shankar. Thank, thank you, you Dr. Warrior. And thank you uh, very much, Dr. Joyce, for very engaging sessions. I'm sure it's early in the morning for you and especially Dr. Ellie as well. It's late in the night in Philippines. So thank you so much for being a part of our session. And it has been really engaging for us. And uh, of course, we've been getting plenty of feedback from the audience as well. They're really engaged throughout the